Hello and welcome to episode 74 of Linux After Dark. I'm Joe. I'm Chris. I'm Gary. And I'm Dalton. Welcome back, chaps. Something dawned on me recently. I no longer set people up with my defaults. I set them up with the defaults. So in the past, I would always set up my wife's Android phone exactly how I have mine with ADW launcher and only one home screen and just everything in the same place, same widgets and everything. But then some of the widgets that I use slowly started to go out of date and stop working properly. And I just built up technical debt on my own phone and also on her phone. And then I bought her a Pixel 7a and I said to her, look, I think you should just use it by default. And she said, all right, whatever. And it took her about a day to get used to it. And now she's happily using it completely stock. And I've always set up people's Linux systems exactly how I have mine. Zubuntu, panel at the bottom, that sort of thing. But I'm starting to think that the next person I set up will probably just be stock Ubuntu because I think it just makes more sense. So I suppose the question is, what do you do? Do you set people up like you have things set up or do you set it up as just pure defaults? If I'm doing a Windows setup for someone, I will set it up more in line with the way that I do. Hopefully they splurge enough that they got Windows 11 Pro so that I can turn off like Copilot and stuff for now. But, you know, I'll move the taskbar to the left because that's where they're obviously used to it because they're a Windows user and they've used it before. I'll turn off all the widgets and stuff because whoever clicks on that icon in Windows, I don't think anyone ever has willingly. And I think that they have the metrics to prove that and they're just too afraid to show them. If I'm working on Linux, though, I'll usually set people up with Ubuntu Mate, which I leave the defaults there, but it isn't the default distribution, per se. And if that, you know, ends up going out of support and we don't get any new versions of it at some point, I guess I would go back to just regular Ubuntu, but that would be a little bit more difficult for people to grasp, I think. With phones, I've lost the battle. I used to install Nova Launcher and they got bought by an ad company. And when I got my wife a Pixel 6a, I restored backups of various applications, but otherwise I just gave it to her and it's an appliance. I feel like the battle's lost there. But I feel like most of the people that I've set up would find GNOME disorientating and they don't enjoy learning a new interface. And it is as simple as the fact that the taskbar is not at the bottom. And I know you can hack GNOME into shape, right? But you need an extension to move the taskbar to the bottom, or is that wrong? I haven't used it for a while. I've honestly never tried. I mean, you need an extension to get the launcher in the first place, the dash to dock extension, say. It stands to reason you probably need to do something like that to get it on the bottom. I don't remember if Ubuntu's dash to dock extension lets you put it on the bottom or not, but the default one does. I mean, the one that's on the extensions website does. Most people I've set up on Ubuntu Mate, and interestingly, I'm running Debian XFCE now, but I wouldn't give them that (laughs) because it's not packaged with all of the polish. I actually think we did an episode about that before, but I feel like it is a bring your own distro when you do it like that. And that's what I love about it. But I very much appreciate the polish lent to Ubuntu Mate, but I just think people would find gnome a bit too jarring and then if they ask for like a notification area for example which i know is like a very controversial topic all the time with gnome but if i said to them you need to install an extension they would be like whoa classic shell for windows is another example it's possible but it's fundamentally kind of hacking to bits whereas changing that stuff is part of the gui in mate and xfce you want to move the taskbar you unlock it you drag it everything is built in. I feel like it wouldn't be familiar enough and I couldn't massage it to be familiar enough. And those people are coming to me for support. They aren't the type of people that read documentation or Google their issues. They send me a message and say, how do I do this? (laughs) See, I think my stance on it has changed quite a lot over time. 15 years or so ago, when I was working in a local computer shop, we had like a super opinionated way of setting up Windows machines where we would turn on the Windows Classic theme and put all of the my computer and my network places icons on the desktop and 
go and disable the sidebar in the file explorer in Windows XP. So it looked like Windows 95 and disable automatic updates and all of these things. Disable automatic updates? Yeah, yeah, that was a thing that we did. I don't know why. Maybe because it got people coming back to us every year when their computer got infected with something because they didn't have automatic (laughs) updates turned on. (laughs) Who knows? I mean, that shop is now long gone. So uh, maybe that, that also says something. But then I moved into the corporate world and then was the guy who was responsible for building the corporate Windows 7 and Windows 10 images that got deployed out by the desktop support guys. And I tried to just leave everything as stock as I could because I didn't want to be getting support calls from the desktop support people asking why this thing is where it is or why the system tray is hidden is one thing that they weirdly used to do and things like that. But I think now I've kind of got to the point where I administer so few machines for other people, like I'm talking my parents or, I mean, my wife's machine is a whole nother story because that just gets left in a drawer most of the time. And I think I've just learned the way that those three or four people like their laptop set up and I just set it up in that way. I think when I moved my mum to Ubuntu four or five years ago, I sort of set it up with friendly things pinned to the dock. And I went and set up Deja Dupe to back up her home directory to Google Drive and things like that. But that's about as far as I went, to be honest, because she just uses a browser and she signs back into her Firefox sync account and everything's there. When I think about Chrome OS, which now seems to be going down the toilet because Google are just like, <laughs> oh, fuck this, just make it Android. But that is an opinionated setup. Obviously, it's very limited in what it can do, but I have given it to people And yes, it is a little bit different, but they've got used to it. But I think it's because it's quite limited and it's quite hard to break it, to be honest. Like you can't get into a pickle as much as you might be able to in Windows or maybe Linux to a degree. I think the familiarity thing is really important as well. Like my mother-in-law, she had a Mac before we gave her a laptop with Linux on. So It is Ubuntu Mate, but it has the um, Mac layout. So it has plank at the bottom and the taskbar along the top just because it's about familiarity. So I guess it's asking the person, what do you like? It's just the majority of people I've set up have come from Windows. So they want a notification area, a taskbar along the bottom and an applications menu with a button you click in the bottom left. Well, it's the middle now, but you know. (laughs) Well, my thinking is, if I put them on just straight Ubuntu, anyone can help them. Because even a technical Windows user can Google the problem and find solutions. Whereas if it's my weird Zubuntu setup, I mean, yeah, they'll probably be able to find the solutions to the problem, but it won't be as common. And so it's kind of trying to be a bit more long-term with my thinking, maybe. I think what I realized was that it's just not sustainable for me to expect everyone to use a computer in the way that I do. And maybe that's why I'm leaning more towards, I don't want to manage this. Here is just a thing that is going to work and is going to do what you need. Whether that's stock Ubuntu, whether that's Mac OS, whether it's a Chromebook, I don't really care at this point. As long as I only have to see it when it's really, really broken. That's sort of the way that I've thought about it at this point. I do wonder if we are a lot more passionate and nitpicky about this stuff than most people are as well. Like they might go, oh, this is different. It's annoying. But then they don't have a stack of laptops, for example. (laughs) Like most people just have a laptop. And if they don't like it, they're like John Travolta gif. They just look around the room and go, well, this is the only one I have. So I better work out how to use it. And that's fine. So I don't know if people worry so much. And maybe you could do that. I could try it. The other thing, maybe it's a prejudice because I think it's probably more slimline. A lot of the time I'd be installing on older hardware and we discussed this in previous episodes. That's changed a bit now, but there was a period there where as long as it had four gigs of RAM and an SSD, it didn't really matter what processor was inside as long as it had two cores, two cores, four threads. But if you put GNOME on it, it would stutter a bit. And it would just not quite be the ticket and putting something a bit lighter on would be better. But I think I need to revisit GNOME because I, I'm i not sure I'm approaching it with a kind of frame of reference that is contemporary enough. Because certainly Plasma is really svelte these days, apart from if Baloo goes all Jungle Book and starts 
ruining everything, you know, <laughs> more Akinadi and all that stuff. There are things in it which can go out of control, but a stock install that's not over-indexing everything and, and all the rest of it is, you know, on a par with anything else in terms of, and you turn the animations right down, of course, if you're an XFC user, but I don't think the golf's that wide anymore. But historically, I would have noticed for a four gig machine versus Gnome and something else. I don't know. I recently went on holiday and took a Bay Trail Chromebook with me running full Fedora 40 with Gnome. And it was really, really noticeable. <laughs> Halfway through the holiday, I actually ended up switching out to XFCE just to make it bearable. Uh -huh. mm. But do people really care if it's a little bit laggy or if it takes a little longer for applications to launch? I mean, are we the only people who care about that really? I mean, most people are using like a Chromebook or, I mean, my dad, for example, is using like a 10-year-old MacBook and he doesn't have any complaints. And when I use it, I think, ah, oh, this is a bit slow. It takes three bounces in the taskbar to open Safari now. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we probably are a lot more picky than the average users. I think we definitely are. My metric for this is always when people used to bring in laptops for repair and they'd be like, oh, it's a bit slow it would still have a spinning rust drive inside <laughs> and you'd turn it on and be sat there for like 40, 50 seconds and it would feel like the end of the world to me. And I'm like, how do you deal with this? And they'd be like, yeah, it's a bit slow. <laughs> like, what? This is insane. Because by that point, a SATA SSD was just de rigueur for any computer I had and NVMe was starting to creep in. So I was like, this is insane. But if you don't know that, and you don't know any different, and you bought this laptop, and as I say, you don't have a stack, it is just your computer, and it's a gradual effect, and you have no point of comparison, I do think we care a lot more and, and get much more frustrated, especially now, all of us, we have access to enterprise level hardware, like <laughs> three out of four of us, especially, like I'm really starting to feel it now with certain workloads because it's blazing fast. <laughs> Obviously, if you throw like mega compute at things. So yeah, I do think it's really important to remember that like the frame of reference is completely different for people. I think even more than that, I mean, most people use their one computer at home and their one computer that's assigned to them at work if they're, you know, doing white collar things. Mm. And their computer at work sure as hell isn't faster than the one they have at home. Not by the time their work machine has Tanium and CrowdStrike and a billion other security things on it. Plus like a whole hive of dust bunnies because it's on the floor and hasn't been touched <laughs> in years. Yeah, absolutely. You're running Microsoft Teams on eight gigs of RAM? Well, that's why you can't do anything here. <laughs> How does anyone get anything done at this company? Okay, this episode is sponsored by 1Password. Imagine your company's security like the quad of a college campus. There are nice brick paths between the buildings. Those are company-owned devices, IT-approved apps, and managed employee identities. And then there are the paths people actually use, the shortcuts worn through the grass that are the actual straightest line from point A to B. Those are unmanaged devices, shallow IT apps, and non-employee identities like contractors. Most security tools only work on those happy brick paths, but a lot of security problems take place on the shortcuts. 1Password Extended Access Management is the first security solution that brings all these unmanaged devices, apps, and identities under your control. It ensures that every user credential is strong and protected, every device is known and healthy, and every app is visible. 1Password Extended Access Management solves the problems traditional IAM and MDM can't touch. It's security for the way we work today, and it's available now to companies with Okta, and coming later this year to Google Workspace and Microsoft Entra. So support the show and check it out at onepassword.com slash Linux After Dark. That's onepassword.com slash Linux After Dark. Quick bit of admin then. First of all, thank you everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to join those people, you can go to linuxafterdark.net slash support. And for either 5 or $10 a month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed of either just this show or all the shows in the Late Night Linux family. And if you want to get in contact with us, you can email show at linuxafterdark.net. I do also think I'm a bit like Gary. I don't do it as much anymore. And I do wonder, like, obviously, the great AI apocalypse that keeps happening and Microsoft flip-flopping on recall, there was a moment there where if they really put their shoulder into it, you know, it's going to be like the Windows 8 adoption bump. It won't be suddenly everyone's running Linux. But... I would expect like more people to approach me. 
But generally these days, I don't do it as much as I used to. I don't set up people's computers. Maybe that's also because now when people ask me for advice, I'm like, uh, I, I can't be bothered. I've spent <laughs> the entire day like troubleshooting various things. I do not have the mental capacity to tell you not to buy your laptop from Curry's and get a refurbished business grade machine again. Like I can't do this anymore. So I do think that's personally what shifted for me a bit as well. I'm not actively onboarding as many people as I used to. Well, frankly, at this point, I don't want to manage anything. I just keep telling people to go and buy a Chromebook <laughs> because <laughs> it updates. They're using the G Suite stuff anyway. Like My wife has a MacBook Air M1 and boots it up, opens Chrome and runs like Google Docs and YouTube. She could absolutely get away with a 250 quid Chromebook, mm. but instead she's running that M1 Air, which is just ridiculous overkill. And I think for most people, it's broadly the same for their home PC, right? They're not doing a huge amount on it. Also, I think people use their work machines a lot at home since we had a lot of remote working. I think people have been given a work machine and if they need office and stuff, they just use that. We grabbed a statistic right in the group chat a couple of months ago because I was surprised at how few people were purchasing laptops. Is that right? I need to look up that statistic now because I, I can't remember. I mean, I certainly know a few people who just use their work laptop and yet you know, this is working in cloud IT stuff and they just use their work laptop if they need something personal and they might own an iPad maybe to do other stuff on, like watch Netflix on a flight or something. But for the most part, it's just work machine and phone. Important note, dear listener, don't do that. Don't mix your personal life with your work laptop, especially not if you work in cloud stuff. <laughs> They're watching everything on your computer. Yeah, my work laptop very much sits closed on my desk when I'm not working. Yeah, I found it. The discussion we had was I thought that people were buying laptops and Gary said people just aren't buying them. And yeah, this is uh, in March of this year on The Verge, laptop sales are really down. So the manufacturers are turning to trying to sell services. And it was the start of this adoption of AI because they're trying to pull back around a corner flagging laptop sales. So yeah, I think part of it is that we can't be asked, but also people aren't buying new machines for us to set up. The statistics are quite staggering. Worldwide PC shipments fell 16% in 2022. And then it was a 28.5% year over year drop in quarter four, and it just hasn't recovered. So people aren't buying computers, except us. We're buying all of them and just putting them in an ever increasing stack in the corner of our rooms. Well, we're buying them all once they become cheap on eBay when no one else wants them. <laughs> I may or may not have literally just been outbid on an X1 Carbon 8th gen. You don't need it. I know I don't need it. That's why I bid 30 quid for it. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's going to be interviewed about the podcast and he's going to be sat on a throne of ThinkPads. You know, he's going to have the armrests with some yeah, and then a exactly. chair made of them. Your problems bore me. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think that you've made a compelling argument, any of you, for setting people up the way I'm set up, really. I think that I should just stick to pure defaults and, you know, mainstream stuff so that it's not really my problem to fix it for them. Yeah, I think defaults are king and then just whatever random tweaks you think might be useful for them. But I certainly wouldn't go changing our desktop environments and things anymore. I have to say, I, I don't feel as strongly about it as I perhaps once would, and maybe next time this is put to me as something to do, I might try it, but I am going to go away and have a another look at stock Ubuntu because I haven't looked at it for, I don't know, maybe 2204 when it first came out, I might have had a quick look, but it's been a while. Yeah, I think we should have a look at GNOME at some point because uh, we did once have a look at GNOME and record an episode, but it was a little bit negative, so we <laughs> deleted the episode, and no one will ever hear it. <laughs> Can I throw a final wrench into this situation? Oh, go on. If someone is using stock Ubuntu, you can sign their email up for an Ubuntu One account and get them Ubuntu Pro and not worry about their computer for another five years. In addition to the five years you weren't worrying about it already. 
That's true, but do you really want to have people with a 10-year-old installation of Ubuntu? They're going to get there anyway, aren't they? I guess I would rather have the base level things they would never worry about taking care of. And then a lot of user space apps are pivoting. I mean, even Chrome OS, before it went down the Android toilet, was pivoting to separating the Chrome browser away from the operating system so that at least the browser element is still getting backported security updates, even when the Chromebook is supposedly end of life. So I would feel a bit better. I think it's a good shout from Dalton that you're not sitting on legacy libraries that are just totally end of life. There is at least an avenue for that stuff to be updated beyond end of life. It depends how often you see that person. Obviously, if you set them up and you don't get to touch the machine and check their running updates properly. But in my experience, most people just, you know, you can set up unattended upgrades, but people go out of their way to avoid it. The the painful memories of Windows Update leave (laughs) ex-Windows users hard. They they don't like any idea of updates because they associate them with bad memories. Well, Dalton, you just sold my having to upgrade my mum's machine to 2404 because <laughs> I'm just going to stick her on Ubuntu Pro and forget about it for another few years. Worth noting, it has been a discussion in the Ubuntu community whether the flavors are supported by Pro or not because a lot of their packages are in universe. So by all technicalities, if a customer asks for it, a paying customer probably, the security team might just fix it. But flavor support ends after three years, so there's still confusion about that as far as I know. Well, maybe that's another pro of just keeping them on stock Ubuntu then. I would say so, yeah. You get five years rather than three, or 10 years if you sign them up. But then do you really want to end up having to update several versions at once? By that point, I'm probably just going to do a fresh install anyway. But if I can kick the can down the road and not have to administer another machine for a few years, I might just do it. I mean, at that point, they might just need a new computer. We might have another Dell 5070 at that point. That's 30 bucks. It's like, well, it'd be rude not to give you a better computer. Mm, Probably. Yeah, that's absolutely the reason that my mum got a 5070, because it replaced her Optiplex 780 or whatever it was. Yeah, because I I would say 10 years is a hardware obsolescence flag in the sand, surely, right? Right. If I was still running a laptop today that was 10 years old, I would be feeling the pain. Where does that put us? What is it? 2024, 2014. That's a fourth gen. That's doable, but it's getting creaky. Yeah. And when you can get so much newer hardware for such a low price, it really is just rude not to give someone a $30 computer when they've been on a Chrome box or something. Well, I was looking up the statistics of the Pentium 5005 that's in my WISE 5070 today, just out of interest. And it is the same performance as a Core 2 Quad 6600, which back in the day was pretty high end. Mm. And that's about what my mum moved from to the WISE 5070. So she basically just got a cheaper power bill and a computer with the same level of power. (laughs) Yeah, because people, they're not going to buy the top of the range 10 years ago either, are they? So yeah, they're, they're going to be running mid to low tier of 10 years ago. So you're bumping them up. Yeah. So I think, yeah, 10 years of OS, 10 years of hardware, and you say to them, both are going at the same time. That's more than fair enough when you consider that most corporate hardware is on a three-year cycle. Yeah, that seems entirely reasonable because the reason that she got the 780 with the Q6600 was because it was at that end of the refresh cycle. So she just got a 5070, which was at the end of a refresh cycle as well. Well, we'd better wrap it up, but do let us know what you do. Do you set people up with your defaults or the defaults? You can email us show at linuxafterdark.net. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Until then, I've been Joe. I've been Chris. I've been Gary. And I've been Dalton. See you later. <laughs>